Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for a family talk. I'm here with Tina Evans and Director Martin, and today we are going to be talking about uh, data, uh, national core indicators, and why uh, it's important for families to participate in these data gathering processes and what the state uses that data uh, and its decision making processes. So thank you both for joining us today uh, and, and taking the time to, to talk with the families that are joining us online. Um, I want to start, Tina, with an overview, National Core Indicators. What is it? What's kind of the history behind it? Give us a mm -hmm. quick overview. Sure. So. Um, NCI, known as uh, uh, National Core Indicators, known as NCI, we have been um, doing it the department now for about 11 years. Um, it is a set of performance measures um, that helps us gauge how we're doing as a state and, and the DD system. Um, there's about um, 100 indicators that look at things like um, community inclusion and choice and safety and health and well-being and, and a variety of different things and um, we ask uh, individuals receiving supports to participate in these surveys as well as families um, and also um, uh, county folks at um, SSAs at county boards of DD to complete some information for us as well. We started it um, as a result of a future subcommittee um, many years ago, and really the, the premise was um, we wanted to adopt this tool um, and get into a partnership with um, NASDES and HSRI um, to have a valid and reliable set of measures, not only to look at how we're doing in Ohio, but compare ourselves to other states as well. Um, right now, there are 46 other states involved in the NCI project, and we have the benefit of, of looking to see where Ohio falls um, compared to those other states. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So, Director, uh, when we see those results, how does Ohio use that information? So, as, as Tina indicated, and, and I'll just wanted to add a little bit about the origins of it and then make a couple of comments about how we use it. But it, it came about, actually about 25 years ago, um, and Ohio was one of the original states that uh, there were seven or eight states who were talking about, hey, we have no way to compare how we're doing in our state with how uh, other states are doing. There's, there's no way to compare. We don't you know, if we just look at ourselves and we're not compared against anything, that's, that's not helpful. And so states put in, a number of states, which Ohio was one, put in money to develop this instrument, which became the National Core Indicators. And as Tina indicated, the idea being, as more and more states came online, so I think when we started, Tina, uh, there were maybe only 25 20, 25 states involved. Less than that even, yeah. Was it? Few, okay. Yeah, fewer than that, but mm -hmm. So it's yeah. kind of been a period of mm -hmm. years that as people have seen the value of it, more and more states are, are, are jumping into it. So we use it in a, in a number of, of different ways. Um, so for example, we know we have uh, staff shortages right now. And so we can, take the National Core Indicators and we can look at questions on it and say, you know, do any of these questions give us indicators about how we're, how we're doing? Um, and so there's one on there, for example, that says, do your staff show up on time? And there's another one that says, do your staff treat you with respect, for example? So those are kind of indicators. They give us some indicators of, um, with the staff shortages, are we seeing a lot of families or individuals reporting to us that their staff aren't showing up on time, which would be a huge concern to the state. And then we can compare our responses on that question to 40, would you say Six. 45, 46 mm -hmm. other states mm -hmm. and see, well, how are we doing in comparison uh, to, to them? And that's just one example of, as Tina indicated, you know, some 100 questions. One that's always important to me uh, is the loneliness question, you know. 
Uh, do you feel lonely? Another one that's real important, uh, do you feel safe in your home and in your neighborhood? Uh, you know, things like that really give the state um, a good sense of the quality of life of folks who are re receiving services from us. And then we can compare uh, folks living at home with mom and dad, for example, because some of the folks that we survey are living at home with mom and dad. Some are living in a small group home. Some are living in an intermediate care facility. So it, it also allows us to do some basic comparison from, from setting to setting to help give us uh, insights as well. And it also has, which is helpful to uh, the state, um, some basic demographic information, like it'll ask the kind of disability. So we can compare the number of folks with autism in Ohio in our service delivery system with Kansas and how many folks in their service delivery system have autism or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. So again, some of those comparisons are, are helpful to states as we look at our population. How many folks in our service delivery system live in mom and dad versus in a small residential setting? Again, we see those numbers vary greatly from state to state and it helps us, again, get a sense of how our demographics, how folks using our system are, are compared to others. And then we've used some of the information to help us from a strategic you know, perspective. Uh, we've looked at, for example, the number of folks where uh, indicates they have a dual diagnosis. And then we can also look at whether they're taking prescription medication. And do they have a diagnosis that kind of matches the kind of medication they're taking. And then from that information, we've often done trainings or look at you know, what additional resources we may want to be offering the field based on some of that kind of information. So I don't know, there's probably other ways, yeah, Tina, you guys have looked and used. I was thinking about the health and safety alerts that we have done. We can look at NCI mm -hmm. data and look at, um, you know, are folks getting their flu vaccines? Are they, are they going for their um, well visits and dental visits and that sort of thing? So we can look at that data and then um, issue some uh, health and safety alerts based on that. And we have done that several times. Great. So, you know, obviously this data is important. We Absolutely. use it for, for all kinds of different things. Tina, can you say a little bit about how the data is collected? What are the tools that we use to, to extract the data? Sure, so um, we have done the adult in-person survey. That is for an individual 18 years and over. Um, we generate uh, a random sample for that survey, and we have always done that survey. Um, and that is collected, um, we contract with Ohio State University Nysonger Center, and um, they uh, hire individuals with disabilities to go out and conduct these interviews and go through the survey with folks. And so um, we gather the information from an in-person conversation and um, then the in information is input into a database and um, then our partner uh, Human Services Research Institute will you know get our information and generate our reports for us. We also this year um, are doing an NCI family survey and um, there are three types of surveys that we're going to do. They're all mail surveys, so, and we will be uh, mailing them from the department, um, and folks will have an opportunity to complete them and, on a hard copy and mail them back to us, or they'll have an opportunity to um, log into a link and complete it electronically. Um, there are three family surveys that we will do um, for folks. There's a family survey for families who have children under the age of 18, we'll have an opportunity to respond. Um, for families who have individuals, um, who are uh, um, uh, family members who are over 18 living in the home that they can complete a survey for. And then also for a family or guardian who has an individual living outside of the home. And so, um, we are um, 
going to be sending those out within the next couple of weeks to folks. And so um, people can kind of stay out on the lookout. We're going to send them in an envelope with, you know, that's a bright color and they'll know it's from us. And um, that's how we're going to be gathering that information. Awesome. And so, oh, sorry to interrupt. Um, you know, something families may wonder, you get it in the mail and you wonder, well, why did they send it to me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And we often get that question. And uh, so the, the selection is really, I believe, uh, computer generated. It's, it's random. totally random. random. And so statisticians will look at the number of people served in Ohio and they will tell us, how many people do you need to survey so that when you get the results, it represents the entire state. So, you know, obviously we couldn't be surveying 40,000 people. Mm -hmm. And so again, statisticians will say, if you sample, and usually it's around 400, I believe. It's 400, yeah. So mm -hmm. if, if you sample 400 people, statistically, we know that's pretty predictive of the whole state. And so then the other part of it is, the selection has to be random. So the computer just goes through, and it randomly selects. So if you as a family get one of these, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean that uh, we have singled you out uh, uh, for whatever reason. It just means the computer automatically picked you out uh, so that we had a, a random sample. So what went into the process of doing the family surveys this time? You mentioned the adult surveys have yeah. been done for years and years. Yeah. What's the importance of the family survey right now? So we wanted to start doing the family survey again because we haven't for quite some time. Um, and How many years? You know, it's it's, been, it's been about five years five since years? we did it. Okay. And you know, we were hearing from families, we, you know, when we weren't reaching our 400 mark, they're completing a lot of surveys and you know, kind of needed a break. Mm -hmm. And so we, we honored that and um, and kind of have, have not done family specific surveys since then. Um, but Ohio being a technology first state now, um, one of the things that we're doing with our NCI surveys this year is incorporating Ohio specific questions related to technology and remote supports. And so um, we added some questions this year that we haven't ever added to the adult in-person survey and to these family surveys so we can hear from families about um, their use of remote supports or assistive technology, um, what they have used or haven't used, what they would like to use. Um, we also asked some questions about transportation this year and some other things. And so um, the technology um, is really what uh, prompted us to be able to do it this year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and really wanting to hear the voices of families so that we get a sense from families, not just the individuals receiving our services, which is critical and important, but also the families. How are they feeling about the services they're getting in Ohio? We have questions about the service and support administrators. You know, do they return your calls? Are they, you know, are they helpful? Um, whoever the provider is who's providing you service. Um, again, we want to make sure that we have the family voice. Uh, and we know this sometimes takes time. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a burden like everything else. But we really want to reinforce how important it is and how it helps us as a state then look at how families are responding and helps us know, you know, do we need to provide some different kind of training to SSAs? Or, we, you know, what do we need to emphasize or to change or provide additional information to make our system uh, better and stronger. So, Director Tina mentioned the Technology First initiative, um, and that kind of brought about this discussion of, of collecting this information mm -hmm. from families. How do you see uh, the information gained from these surveys being used in the Technology First piece of everything? So, one of, one of the reasons that we really wanted to do this is that we've had a number of different focus groups that have involved uh, families and we also have the Tech Council which is working over a six-month period to put together a plan for the expansion of the use of uh, remote support services uh, here in Ohio and as a part of that it's been critical to hear the stories of families and 
hearing the stories of how these remote supports have really provided a improvement in quality of life for their son or daughter, brother or sister, whatever family member happened to be using it, but how it's improved their quality of life, how it's improved their independence, and in some cases helped really relieve families of some of the responsibilities uh, that they had. And so as we listened to these individual stories, we thought, boy, it would be powerful, given the number of people who are now using uh, remote supports in Ohio, given that we have more people in Ohio using remote supports than any other state in the nation, we thought it would be interesting to sample their opinions mm -hmm. and get a sense about their satisfaction with it, um, not just as Tina mentioned, what are you using, why are you using it, but we're, we're curious how that will impact some of their responses related to staff satisfaction, because with remote supports, often you know your staff could be 100 miles away communicating through the two-way communication. That's very different than someone in your house. So again, we're, we're kind of curious how those responses will differ, how satisfied people are, uh, how does the loneliness uh, you know, how does that impact it if you're using remote supports or a person? So it's, it's again, it's to help us as a state get better information to continue to help us do better. And this area of remote supports we, we view as critical. And the fact that we have enough that we can do it and most other states can't. So we're having a lot of states watching Ohio in terms of where we're at on remote supports. And we think this will be another area we can kind of lead the way on in terms of getting some, you know, some real hard information on how people are impacted by it. Tina, you mentioned that uh, previously the family surveys kind of had a low response rate. What, what are we doing to maybe help educate families, know that it's coming out, what are we doing to maybe make it a little more convenient for them to, to be able to complete the surveys? So the, uh, the electronic option is new now. Mm -hmm. That wasn't um, in existence before. So hopefully there will be some folks who, you know, will find it easier to be able just to log on and, and complete the information online and not have to, you know, send it back or anything. Right. Um, we have been uh, partnering with um, uh, folks here in the department to get the word out in various different um, forums. Um, our Family Advisory Council, um, yeah, um, I'm thinking about our core group that helps plan that meeting that are connected to organizations to um, really talk with them a lot about it, get input from them, use their suggestions, and then um, put those things into place. Awesome. Director, if you could give um an example or your thoughts on we've been talking about data a lot and and we use it a lot at the department can you give an example of how um, that data has been used to affect the lives of families um, the what internally we kind of use that data for when we're talking about supports for families I, I think a, a couple of examples that come uh, Kind of quickly to mind that you know some of them affect families in indirect ways uh, perhaps but one of the things when we were uh, looking at was which Tina mentioned earlier so there's there's a question on there about um, or a fair amount of questions on health related questions about you know going to the dentist, uh, going to the doctor, uh, doing preventative kinds of uh, uh, doctor's visits. And one of the things that we have seen is a lower response rate among folks living at home with mom and dad than what we see if folks are being served by an agency. And part of the reason perhaps is that if an individual is living in a in a group home, if they don't get an annual physical and um, don't get dental visits, we ding them on, on compliance. And, and the same thing doesn't happen when they're living at home with, with mom or dad. So one of the things 
is kind of looking at are there ways that we could better support families because we know that taking somebody to a dental visit can be incredibly stressful and uh, a lot of the folks that we serve have had as many of us have some unpleasant experiences mm -hmm. you know sitting in those uh, dental chairs mm -hmm. and so if you've had a number of those then it's a big deal you know again it it makes it pretty easy to say boy I'm gonna skip this so I think that's an example of something we look at we see those numbers as it relates to uh, uh, folks being served in families as much lower than what we see in in folks as I mentioned earlier in agencies so you think about that strategically are there ways that we could better support families so that their, their sons or daughters uh, can do and can we help them with those things that are uncomfortable so I was thinking I think we you know we had a, uh, a a family group on one of our previous grant projects who did a project about helping us think about how we desensitize somebody so if you have a son or daughter with seizure disorder and you have to do blood draws is is there a way that you can do things to help desensitize and make it easier if you're taking your son or daughter to get a blood draw and so they did some you know some videos to help with things like that again that grew out of some of the data that we saw uh, of, of the differences between the two groups so those are just you know an example although there's a number of different parts to that there where we're trying to see and, and learn from the survey and, and help us support families in new and different ways. Yeah. Those are some good examples of how we use it internally. Tina, are there, is there a way for families to look and see past data? Uh, where yeah. can they go to see the actual data sets and maybe some, some neat graphics? Yeah, on uh, our DODD website, um, we have a data page and there's lots of different data sources on this data page and NCI is one of them. And when you um, click on the NCI section, we have our most recent state report for Ohio. We have a report that will show where Ohio is compared to all of the other states. So all of, all of the state's data is in there. Um, and there also is a link um, where folks can click on and go to the actual NCI project page at HSRI and you can access Ohio's data and even manipulate it with charts and um, graphs and um, that sort of thing. So lots of opportunity for folks to actually see the data and manipulate it too based on living arrangement or age or disability. If somebody's interested in becoming an uh, NCI interviewer, mm -hmm. what's the process for them to do that? Yeah, so the, um, as I mentioned earlier, Ohio State University Nysonger Center is uh, heading that um, part of the project up. They are hire, recruit and hire folks, so they would um, uh, need to connect with, with them um, and they can, you know, help them through the process of filling out an application and that sort of thing, getting the right training and, and onboarding. You can certainly reach out to me and I can get people connected. Great. To them. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about the adult surveys, the family surveys. When should folks be expecting these? Have they already gone out? Say a little yeah, bit about the, the time yeah, the, frame. The family surveys have not gone out yet. Um, we have just started communication about the uh, NCI adult consumer survey. So people um, may be getting communication about, oh, you know, you were randomly selected for this uh, NCI adult in person. We should have those family surveys out within the next few weeks. Um, so families will start receiving correspondence um, from us at the department to complete those family surveys um, by the end of November. Great. Mm -hmm. And we know how busy families are, and mm -hmm. we know this is one more thing, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it, it's really a big help mm -hmm. to us at the department and just you know, really encourage families to to take the time to do it because we need to hear their voices and again it will help us improve our system great great well i just wanted to you know end it by asking the two of you to, uh, to affect change within uh, some of the supports and systems that we have 
I would just say that, you know, as you're getting communication from us and um, you see that um, your son, daughter, brother, sister was, was randomly selected and you're not quite sure if um, that person can participate or not, um, call me. We can have conversation about, you know, it's okay if um, a person is verbal or nonverbal. We want to hear from everyone and we, you know, are, have the ability to um, communicate with folks who are nonverbal and conduct those interviews um, in a variety of ways. And so I think if, in, in, if there are folks who are thinking, oh, you know, not going to be able to do that, give me a call and we can have a conversation about how we can and how important it is to hear from everybody. I think the other interesting thing we're really looking forward to is as Tina mentioned when we started off, it's been five years that we've kind of done the family survey. So it's going to be interesting to see how families' perceptions of the system have changed mm -hmm. over that five-year period. And what are the trends? So that comparison, given that five-year window, is kind of going to be critical to see you know, where do we need to focus our attention over the next couple of years? And what areas do we need to strengthen our system? Um, and why has the family perception of a particular item gone up or gone down? And, and again, it's that piece. And then I think what'll be fun is bringing, and once the survey is done, is kind of doing one of these talks again, mm -hmm. showing the data, uh, and, and kind of showing some of the results and getting mm -hmm. feedback from families. So what do you think of the results? Does that seem, you know, to mirror your experience or whatever? So I think it'll provide, you know, a good opportunity for additional feedback and additional discussion about our system. Great. Well, thank you both for taking the time to, again, talk with families. And thanks to everybody who's viewing online. Uh, really appreciate the time that you took to to listen about this very important topic uh, that we, we hope that you will participate in uh, once you receive the information. Uh, wanted to point out that Family Talk is going to be taking a holiday break in December, uh, so be looking for the next Family Talk to happen in January. Um, also wanted to let you know that you can always find any upcoming family events uh, on our Facebook events page or by visiting the Supporting Families at DODD webpage at dodd.ohio.gov. So again, thank you everybody, and we'll see you next time on the next Family Talk.